Well, good morning. It has been a good morning to worship together, to celebrate baptism. It has been good to be here already. Welcome to White Plains Baptist Church. My name is Gary, and I, I joyfully serve as the senior pastor here. And if you're new to us, I want to say welcome. Thank you for being our guest. You are an answer to prayer. I've been praying for you and your family this week, and I hope that you have uh, experienced this church to be a warm and welcoming group of people. Thank you again for being our guest uh, this morning. Kids, it's always good to see you here at church. I'm going to say welcome to you all. And uh, wasn't it good seeing Kennedy get baptized? That was, that was a good thing to see. And so kids, have, have you been baptized yet? Baptism is an outward display of something that happens inside you. It's something you do to show the world and the church that you believe in Jesus. And Kennedy showed us this morning that she believes in Jesus. She believes that Jesus is God and that Jesus has made her right with God. And what a great statement that is. What a great statement our baptism is. And we're planning on having another baptism this afternoon. This one's going to be in a creek, though. So it's going to be different. Your friend Griffin Keltner is going to make the same statement that Kennedy just made in her baptism, uh, that he believes that Jesus is God and that Jesus has made him right with God. And you know what else? Griffin's dad is going to get baptized with him. And so it's going to be a pretty fun afternoon this afternoon out at the creek. Griffin's dad, Brandon, he's believed in Jesus for a long time. But he wants to get baptized the way that you saw Kennedy get baptized. He wants to get all the way wet. And this is how we see Jesus getting baptized in the Bible. And so this afternoon, we're going to go down to the creek at their house, and we're going to baptize Griffin and Brandon, and we're going to get them all the way wet, just like Jesus. They wanted me to invite you and, to the, and the whole church, if you want to come and celebrate with them, uh, be out at their house. They have a creek on their farm that we're going to do the baptizing. Be at their house at 1.30, and we'll be in the creek at 2. If you need their address, we have their address out at the welcome desk. Or kids, you can ask your parents or grandparents to talk to, to Griffin's parents before y'all leave today. But if you haven't been baptized and you believe in Jesus, kids, I would ask you to uh, make sure your parents know about that, and then you guys get together with me, and let's talk about what it means to believe in Jesus and get baptized uh, soon so that you can show others what is happening inside of you. Also, don't forget that Vacation Bible School is this weekend coming up, and so ask your parents to register you if they haven't already. Kids, thank you for being uh, at church with us this morning. You are dismissed to go on up to the lobby to be taken up to Kids Church. Uh, kids Church is for kids in kindergarten through sixth grade. And parents and grandparents, you can pick them up in the lobby after our service is over. And as they're leaving, I would make the same invitation to our adults and teenagers. If you have faith in Jesus and you haven't been baptized or you haven't been fully immersed that's being baptized by getting all the way wet. Let's talk about what baptism means uh, and what that looks like for you. It's an act of being obedient to God. It's an act of being obedient to His Word. It's a moment to celebrate and to encourage each other. We're going to be looking at Psalm 82 this morning as we continue in our summer series, Summer in the Psalms, where we're trying to get to know God better in the Psalms. This series is winding down, and we will finish it at the end of the month. And I hope you're learning a lot about God through this series and His Word. Um, this morning, we're going to be getting into some weeds. We're going to get into some, some odd topics and go a little deeper than we normally would on a Sunday morning. But uh, I hope you find it interesting, what we're going to look at in Psalm 82. I absolutely find what we're going to look at here in this psalm very interesting. We're going to uncover from what... From the Bible, what might be a little weird. There's some weird stuff in the Bible, and we shouldn't ignore it. We shouldn't not read it. We should look at it and struggle with it, even if it's weird. You may want to put some of the resources that we've talked about in the How to Change Your World in 20 Minutes a Day series to help you interpret what we're about to read. This is the art of hermeneutics, of trying to understand and interpret what the Bible is teaching us. It will be helpful this morning. So let's look at Psalm 82 this morning. God has taken his place in the, in the divine council. In the midst of the gods, he holds judgment. 
How long will you judge unjustly and show partiality to the wicked? Give justice to the weak and the fatherless. Maintain the right of the afflicted and the destitute. Rescue the weak and the needy. Deliver them from the hand of the wicked. They have neither knowledge nor understanding. They walk about in darkness. All the foundations of the earth are shaken. I said, you are God's. Son of the Most High, all of you, nevertheless, like men, you shall die and fall like any prince. Arise, O God, judge the earth, for you shall inherit all the nations. Let's pray in response to what we just read. God, thank you so much for your word. Thank you for the truth that we'll try to uncover as we struggle with some tough issues that this psalm brings. Be with us. Help us to look at your word. Give us clarity. Give us understanding this morning. We thank you for Jesus. We thank you for this morning of worship. It's in his name that we pray. Amen. So before we get into the weird stuff, let me quickly tell you who wrote this psalm. Your Bible probably says at the top of this psalm, this is a psalm of Asaph. Is that what your Bible says? A psalm of Asaph. So Asaph was a worship leader at the time of David. In fact, he was probably David's worship leader uh, in the temple area. Uh, David wrote many of the psalms. He wrote a lot of the psalms. And last week I told you that David compiled. He put the psalms together um, and uh, he put them in the order that we, we probably have them. Asaph wrote around 12 psalms. So he wrote several. And you can think of Asaph kind of like Brett Oliver, a worship leader. Brett leads our worship. He's written some worship songs, but you can also think of Asaph kind of like Jonathan Chain, too. He's our drummer. Asaph is the keeper of the cymbals, and he's the, so Asaph is kind of a blend of Jonathan and Brett. The genre of Psalm 82, though, is a lament. As you can, as you can look at what we just read there is lament going on. One more thing before we get to the weird stuff. This is the first psalm. I didn't read it, but it's in your print in the Bible there. Uh, this is the first psalm that we've looked at that has the word Selah in it. People have wondered what this word means for a really long time. We really don't know. We guess, we think it means pause or stop or break, kind of like in music terms. I don't know anything about music, but it's like a musical stop is what people think it means. We don't know. That's why we don't translate it. It's, it's Hebrew. Uh, it, it also might mean forever blessing. That's what some people hold it to mean, but, but we don't know what that word means, but it's interesting and it's there. But let's, let's jump into the weird stuff, okay? So we're going to be in, in Psalm 82. Now, what, what is being said here? in Psalm 82 is much easier to understand than to try to nail down to whom it's being said. Let's look at verse 1 again. God has taken his place in the divine council. In the midst of the gods, he holds judgment. So God is taking his place in this courtroom of sorts. What is this divine council? This is where the controversy begins. Now, when I say controversy, I mean debate. Um, there are thoughts on two sides on what this divine council is. There's really smart people who've put a lot of time and energy into thinking through this on both sides of this debate. It's a minor issue. It's not a big deal. It's an interesting deal, and it shouldn't cause division from what I'm, what I'm about to say. Um, whichever side you're on, it's okay. I'm on one side, but I've been on the other side of this debate. And what's important is that you use the Bible to be your primary influencer when you decide on what side to land on. You want to be aware of when you're letting what others tell you, what tradition is, or maybe using your own logic when that... Um, influences your position on matters like this, they will impact your thoughts, absolutely. But the Bible should be the loudest and most definitive voice in shaping what we think about the Bible and what we think about the world around us. So what is 
this divine council. The New Living Translation calls it heaven's court. What is that here in Psalm 82.1? There's a couple of options. The first option is that God is either coming before a group of human leaders who are not surprised that he meets with them. Think of it as something like God meeting a group of world leaders like at a summit. He comes before this group of, of world leaders, and there's not anything in the Bible that shows that these human leaders are surprised or in awe of God being there. So that's one idea. He's in front of the human leaders of the nations. Many smart and educated people think that's what it means. I like the other idea, though. As you'll see, it's much more in line with what we know of God biblically and what we know of how humans respond to God's presence. But it's a little weirder. This other idea is that God is coming before a group of heavenly created beings, little g gods, that he has created, that God has created. God created them, and then at some point in the past, God had given them charge over pagan nations to judge and to rule. Now, anytime we think about little g gods, things seem to get a little weird, don't they? It can even feel like saying little g gods we're somehow equating them to big G gods, the one true God, and we're not. These aren't the same. They are not. But in Psalm 82.1, the Bible makes mention of plural little g gods. So we are able to speak about them and use this term without feeling weird. But what does it mean? Who are these little g gods? Last week I gave you a term in Hebrew, Elohim. This word Elohim is used in the Old Testament 2,681 times. 2,330 of those times, that word has been translated meaning big G, the one true God. It's about 87% of the time as the translators have translated the Old Testament, they've used that word to represent the one true God. The translators use this word 254 times as deity, or little g gods. Elohim is also translated as sons of God five times. We're going to spend much more time discussing these little g gods coming up in our fall uh, Wednesday night series, The Invisible Creation Class. It begins on August 9th, and I I highly recommend you come and be a part of this class if this is an interesting topic to you. Uh, This topic will help you understand your position and your purpose as a Christian human saved by Jesus. My view is that we are reading about, in Psalm 82, about God speaking to a group of heavenly created beings that he has given charge over the earth at some point in the past before this scene happens there are many smart people who don't think this is what it what it is but there are smart people who agree with me on this and i see it this way that this is the case for a few reasons the first is humans cannot see god and live right if god is speaking to the human leaders here they should die because you can't be in God's presence. This is what God says to Moses in Exodus 33, 20. But he said, You cannot see my face, for man shall not see me and live. So God is close to Moses, very close to Moses, and even Moses couldn't see God face to face. God didn't show Moses himself because God cared for Moses. He knew what would happen if God revealed himself completely to Moses. In this divine council, we have God revealing himself to this audience. They are in his presence. So I don't think they can be humans because they don't immediately die. Now, you may think about the time that God wrestled with Jacob as a way of when God was with a human, and and he didn't die. And that's a good thought to consider. But in that case of Jacob wrestling with God, Jacob didn't know it was God, and so God must have hidden himself in a way that, that wasn't a full revelation of who he was. 
that doesn't seem to be what is what happening in, in, 80, in Psalm 82. God is rightfully judging these rulers. God is known to be God in this divine council. Now, another reason why I think this is a group of heavenly created beings is because God has a biblical history of meeting with heavenly created beings concerning humanity. He does this at least two other times. Genesis 1.26 says this, Then God said, Let us make man in our image, after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the heavens, and over the livestock, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. This is in the middle of the first creation story that we have in Genesis. Now some look at this passage, and they see a very early acknowledgement of the Trinity. When God says, let us make, to whom is he speaking? It is possible that who we think of as God the Father is speaking with God the Son and God the Holy Spirit. It is possible that this is a reference to the Trinity, but it's unlikely. Now, why would God, who is one, need to speak to himself or think out loud when creating? I don't think he does. The triune God would already know what he is thinking. It is likely God is speaking to this heavenly created beings about his plans to create humanity. Verse 26 here says that God says, let us make. Then in verse 27, which is not on your screen, it says that God alone does the creating work of creating hum humanity. So the rather newly created heavenly realm is witnessing God creating humanity. And God is somewhat commentating in front of this divine council as he creates humanity in front of them. I find this stuff fascinating. I hope you are too. I, I'm laying some groundwork for the upcoming Invisible Creation class uh, but let's look at, me, let's look at uh, one more place where God speaks to a group of heavenly created beings. This is in Job 1, 6, and 7. Now there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan also came among them. The Lord said to Satan, From where have you come? Satan answered the Lord and said, from going to and fro on the earth, and from walking up and down on it. Job is the oldest book in our Bible. It's possibly the oldest book ever written. The oldest book of the Bible opens with the scene of a regular and normal time when these sons of God come before the Lord, this divine counsel. Let me give you another Hebrew word that is found in Job, Yahweh. This is the word that's translated as Lord, especially when it's all capitalized. In Job, we have the Elohim coming to meet Yahweh. The sons of God are coming before the Lord to present themselves before him. And did you catch who was with them? Verse 6 says that Satan also came along, the sons of God and the, Elo the Elohim. The Bible is fascinating. The Bible is absolutely fascinating, and I'm not making this stuff up. It's all right here in print for you to easily read. And what you read throughout your Bible is more fascinating than what you can watch on television, what's on TikTok, and what's on YouTube. Spending time reading your Bible, going through all of it, is helpful. It's beneficial. It's engaging. It's interesting. And I'm certain that there are parts of the Bible that we haven't spent any time with because... They're weird, or we don't understand them, or people have told us that they're hard to understand. Um, I spent so much time this morning looking at Psalm 82, 1, simply to point out that God is speaking to a group of heavenly created beings that he's giving some type of control to in the past. Now, this past event that God gave control of the pagan nations when he gave it to these heavenly created beings was in Genesis 11. This is the Tower of Babel. As God dispersed creation after the tower was, was being built, Genesis 11 
is a foundational chapter to our purpose as Christian humans saved by Jesus. Spend time in Genesis 11 this week to understand what all is happening. Here's what Deuteronomy says about this and how it ties it to these heavenly created beings. When the Most High gave to the nations their inheritance, when He divided mankind, this is what's uh, referenced in Genesis 11, He fixed the borders of the peoples according to the number of the sons of God. But the Lord's portion is His people. Jacob his allotted heritage. So God divided up the nations and gave them over, gave them over to the control of these little g gods. But he said to Jacob, the Hebrew people, that they will be his people. This is when what will become known as the people of Israel become God's chosen people. So I see Psalm 82 coming out of this scene of Deuteronomy 32 as a result of Genesis 11. It all connects. God is gathering the sons of God, and he's not pleased with the way that they're ruling or judging the pagan nations. This is weird, isn't it? A little bit different, probably different than what you've understood the Bible as in the past. It was weird for me when I started first to connect these dots. Connecting these dots is a part of hermeneutics, of trying to understand and interpret what the Bible is saying. We're connecting these dots to help us better understand what's in the Bible. It's okay if it's weird. It's okay if it's new to you. It's okay if you still want to think of this group as human leaders, whether these are heavenly created beings who God had given control of the nations to, or if they are human leaders who can somehow be in God's presence and not die. It doesn't matter who the who this audience is that God is speaking to, the message is the same. What we learn about God here in Psalm 82 is the same. They, whoever they are, haven't done what God would want them to do. They messed up, and God is going to fix it. In your notes, God cares about His creation even when his creation doesn't care about him. Do you realize that? God cares about his creation, even when they don't care about him. He cares about his creation, even when they don't know about him. That is who God is. God is addressing the leaders of pagan nations. These are nations who don't know Or don't believe God. They don't acknowledge God as God. But God is showing concern. He's showing care for them. When the world runs around and acts like the world, full of strife, sin, and rebellion, we see that God still cares. You need to know that God cares for you. Even if you're deep in sinful rebellion right now, God cares for you. Let's continue in verse 2 of Psalm 82. The rest of this passage is much more clear. Psalm 82, 2. How long will you judge unjustly and show partiality to the wicked? Those who are in control, those who are ruling or judging the world are doing it differently than what God wants. And by doing it differently than what God wants, they're doing it wrong. God is patient but God sees injustice. God is patient, but he sees injustice. There is right, there is wrong. God knows it, God defines it. He reveals it to us in the Bible. The rulers of the world were doing it wrong. They were unjust. They were showing partiality to the wicked, to those who do wrong. And by the time of Asaph, of him writing this, the unjust and partial to the wicked behavior had been going on for a long time. God is patient, but he sees the injustice, and he's about to do something about it. Let's look in verses 3 and 4. Give justice to the weak and the fatherless. Maintain the right of the afflicted and the destitute. Rescue the weak. And the needy, deliver them from the hand 
of the wicked. God expects power to provide for the powerless. God expects power to provide for the powerless. God tells these judges what to do. Now, this wasn't news to them. They were in rebellion. This is the expectation, expectation that God has for us, too. If you are in a position of power, you are to provide for the powerless. And you're probably in a position of some type of power. Whether at home, at work, in the community, there are countless venues of us to, to gain and, and exercise power. And you're probably in some type of position of power. And God expects power to provide for the powerless. And there's always the powerless around us. God sees how we mistreat and ignore them. God commands justice. In verses 5 through 7, we, we read this. They have neither knowledge nor understanding. They walk about in darkness. All the foundations of the earth are shaken. I said, you are God's. Son of the Most High, all of you, nevertheless, like men, you shall die and fall like any prince. Not only are these rulers doing things wrong, they aren't concerned with doing things right. The New Living Translation calls them ignorant. They don't have any concern that they are doing things wrongly. They walk around even though the world around them is shaking, they still do things wrongly. And God says, enough. He brings down judgment on these rulers. God punishes improper power. These rulers grossly misuse their power, and God contrasts their future with their past. They were heavenly created spiritual beings. They had been given power and authority over nations of the world. They rebelled and they misused their power, and God condemns them to die like humanity. Death is the result of sin. Sin always brings death. It impacts these heavenly created beings in rebellion too. Death comes because of sin. We're seeing God act similarly in his two created realms of creation. God is holy and sin brings death. Let's look at the last verse of this passage. Verse 8 says this, Arise, O God, Judge the earth, for you shall inherit all the nations. This passage might have started off in some weird places, in some weeds, but it ends with familiar truth. Though sin and injustice are everywhere, God cares. God is holy. God is righteous. God knows what is good and what is evil. God defines it, and God is patient. Though we live in a world that can seem hopeless, those of us who know God to be who He says He is, those of us who know of God's faithfulness, we have hope. Our hope is that God will bring back the lost. Our hope that we find here in Psalm 82 is the same hope that we find in the rest of the Bible, that God will bring back the lost. God will save the lost. This passage points us to Jesus. Jesus is the one who will ultimately put everything right with God. It's right to punish wickedness. One day, the wicked will be finally and completely punished. Even though it is right to punish the wicked, we see that God is patient, and He's full of grace, and He cares for
for His creation, even those who are in rebellion and are lost. I'll invite the worship team to come back up. This grace is found in doing what Kennedy demonstrated in her baptism. She is safe from the coming punishment of wickedness. She trusts in Jesus. This is the hope that we have if we're trusting in Jesus. This is the same hope that is offered to you. When verse 8 says, Arise, O God, judge the earth, for you shall inherit all the nations, we know that God will bring back the lost. God cares for his creation. God cares for you. Even though you don't maybe not acknowledge him or even know him, you can know that God cares for you. He will bring you to safety if you trust him. Will you trust him today? Stand as we pray. God, we thank you for your word. We thank you for Jesus. We thank you for the hope that we have that you will bring back the lost. You are powerful enough to save. You are in control. You are patient and you care. You see what's wrong and you can make it right. Help us to trust you today. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.